There it goes. Perfect. There we go. You got it now. All right. Sorry. Oops. Let's go back a slide. So yes, I am Dr. Beth Brady. Um, I work at Moat Marine Laboratory. I just started there a couple of months ago. So yeah, I study uh, manatee communication, which I've been doing for the past 12 years. And what I'm showing you there is an image of a manatee vocalization. And when I started working in manatee acoustics or manatee communication, there was a lot of things that I had to learn, particularly about acoustics itself. How does sound travel? How does sound propagate? What are important sounds to animals themselves? And how does the environment influence uh, communication? So I just want to give you a little brief primer into acoustics. Um, and into a little bit about how sound propagates, particularly in water, and how animals use sound to communicate and what might be important to animals in their environment. So interestingly, sound travels a lot faster in water than it does in air. So sound travels about 1500 meters per second in water and about 340 meters per second in air. Water is a lot more denser than air, which allows sound to travel a lot further. So you may be underwater and may be hearing something and you're not quite sure where it's coming from, where in air it might be a little bit more easier to localize where sound is coming from, where it's a lot more difficult to do so in water. So the speed of sound or how fast sound travels depends on a couple of different factors. So the speed of sound will increase with increasing water temperature, increasing salinity, and increasing pressure or depth. So the approximate change in the speed of sound with the changing property is about a temperature about each one degree Celsius. An increase in temperature increases about four meters per second. And each increase in salinity, so more the more salt water you get into, increases about 1.4 meters per second. And when the deeper you go, increases about 17 meters per second. So this image I have on the right hand side is the sound speed profile or how sound travels in water in for a certain area. So at the surface, right, the sun is heating up those surface layers. So sound travels just a little bit faster at the surface. As you go deeper, it gets more saltier, right? It gets um, a little bit more pressure. So it kind of lessens a little bit. And then as you go to the water depths, right, now we're getting a lot more pressure. Sound is increasing a lot faster the deeper that you go in the water column. So we also know that sound doesn't travel in exactly a straight line. So when I'm talking to you right now, it seems like my voice is projecting right out to you, right? But sound doesn't travel in a straight line. It goes in many different directions. So it can bounce off the sea surface. It can bounce off the ocean floor. So you have to take this into account when you're setting sound, particularly underwater. It also depends on the substrate you're working at, right? So if you have sand, that might travel a little bit differently than you have a really rocky bottom. So imagine a huge boulder in the pathway of your sound, right? So sound can actually bounce off of that boulder, not actually go in the direction you exactly want it to. So when we talk about acoustics, we talk about passive acoustics and active acoustics. And passive acoustics is just that, it's just listening to the sound itself and the sounds that's being produced in the environment. And I do a lot of this. So actually I listen to a lot of the sounds that managers are creating. I don't actually put a lot of sound into the water itself. And active acoustics is just that, looking at how sound or putting sound into the water to see what happens. Now I have done a little bit of this work. I actually just did playback experiments in Mexico we actually put sound in the water, other manatee sounds, and I played them to manatees to see how they responded both vocally and behaviorally. So how does this work in the natural environment? We actually use some active acoustics and passive acoustics around the world, right? So some active acoustics are things that we use is called echo sounding or how we use to use sound to map the ocean floor. So for example, the image on the left, um, the boat is actually producing a sound. So the return echo is recorded by the ship and actually gives you like a map of the sound or, or the topography of the ocean floor. We can also use passive acoustics in the example to the right to record um, seismic waves. 
So the hydrophone or the underwater microphone is actually recording the sounds from an earthquake. And this can kind of tell us underwater when there is an earthquake happening. So an earthquake is going to release a seismic wave that's going to release some sound energy that can be recorded passively uh, by a hydrophone to kind of tell us when an earthquake is taking place. So what's some of the equipment that we use to record underwater sound? And these are some of the examples of hydrophones that we use or underwater microphones. So this is a typical setup that I use in the wild. I put all my electronic components in a case to keep them nice and dry. And I put the hydrophone in the water to record the sound. This neat little image right here is called a D-tag. And what scientists use these for is to actually attach these to an animal with this with suction cups so it can record individual animals it can record their sounds it can record record the sounds of other animals it can also record the depth of what they're at if the animal is moving or not and how the animal moves or pitch and roll is what we call it so when we're recording animal sounds we want to look at frequency and amplitude. And frequency, I want you to think of like turning your radio dial to a specific tune so you can hear specific radio stations. So frequency is rather important. Amplitude, I want you to think of amplitude as volume or how loud the sound is. So to give an example of why frequency might be important, what I'm showing you here is uh, some spectrograms or visual representations of sounds of blue whales and of manatees. Now the top part here is called a waveform and a waveform is a measure of amplitude or how loud a sound is. So the louder your sound is, you're going to see more lines like this. So this is going to be kind of louder and this is going to be kind of louder and this in here is not as loud. And the spectrogram here is of a blue whale vocalization. And down here, I have manatees for you. But what, what I really want you to notice is the frequent least frequency scale over here. So blue whales are one of the largest marine mammals in the ocean, and they make sounds that are less than 100 hertz. And this is outside of the range of human hearing. So you and I can't are unable to hear it. So very low frequency sounds, and it's because they're such a large marine mammal. Manatees, on the other hand, now they're in kilohertz, right? So this is five kilohertz, where blue whales are at 100 hertz. Manatees are at five kilohertz. And this is within the range of human hearing. So understanding frequency gives you a better idea of where you might look for vocalizations that animals might produce. Something a lot larger, like a blue whale, is going to be a lot lower in frequency. Something smaller, like a manatee, is something that we might be able to hear in our hearing range. So what else is important? So I talked about frequencies. We have to talk about marine mammals who vocalize in their underwater environment. So animals like dolphins and killer whales, they tend to live in groups and they use vocalizations a lot to be able to communicate with conspecifics. Dolphins actually produce what we call signature whistles or whistles or communication that they use to identify individuals. Killer whales actually have what we call dialects or something that resembles language depending on the group or the focal group that they live in. Now, humpback whales are rather fascinating, right? So they don't tend to live in groups, but the males, when they're in Hawaii and in their breeding grounds, they sing these elaborate songs to attract females. Now, manatees are rather interesting as well. They also don't live in groups and they do vocalize, but their vocalizations are the most important because Calves tend to stay with their mom for about one and a half to two years. So communication is quite important between mothers and calves so they can find each other if by chance they get separated. But just as in communication as important for me and you to be able to talk to one another, communication is very important for these animals. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of ambient noise or noise in the environments that can be rather loud. Um, so there's different types of noise that you have in an environment. You have anthropogenic noise, which is man-made. You have biological noise, which is produced by other animals. And you have ambient noise, which is natural noise that's found in the environment. So what I wanted to show you in these next couple of slides are sounds that are produced in the environment. I want you to try and guess what kind of sound, what kind of animals is either anthropogenic, biological, or ambient noise that are producing these sounds? So what we want to look at, so just to give you a general background, this is a spectrogram or a visual representation of sound. And this is what you want your sound to look like. This is a nice 
clean spectrogram. There's a lot, a lot of noise in the background. And here, there's a lot of noise. And what I've blocked out for you in red is that manatee vocalization. And that's obscuring the sound. It makes it difficult for animals to communicate. So let's look at some of the noises that we might find. So if I can get up here. Oops, oops, back up a little bit. I gave it away. So, ah. Uh, I make that go away. Fortunately, I'm not going to be able to play the sound here. For some reason, the sound clip is up above here. So this is the sound of, when we say these, snapping shrimp, right? So snapping shrimp make these rather loud. It looks like, um, it sounds like crackling sounds. These are the bane of my existence here in Florida. And snapping shrimp have these, these claws that you can see right here. And these claws produce what's called a cavitation bubble. It sounds like a popping, like if you pour uh, milk in your rice crisps, use that crackling sound. And they produce this cavitation bubble that pops and it's actually used to stun their prey. And they actually think it might be used, excuse me, pardon me, as a defense mechanism. <coughs> So this is another sound here. Oh, stop sharing. Sorry. <laughs> I'm hoping this is not playing for some reason. This is rather unfortunate. Back up a second. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having some technical issues, it looks like this morning, that my PowerPoint does not want to agree with me. And I'm in the circle of death right now. Stephanie, are you able to play the, uh, I know you have my PowerPoint, are you able to play it on your end? Sure, let me see if I can get this pulled up really quickly, because you're right, that's unfortunate. We want to hear those sounds. Yeah, and I can't, I'm not able to play them at the moment. So maybe you can play them for me because I'm not, I'm struggling here right now. Apologize. Yeah, I see that. No, not at all. Uh, one second here. Let me go to that slide. Beth, while Stephanie is doing that, would you like to start to answer any of the questions in the chat perhaps? Yeah, let me definitely do that. Oh, the black dots on the sides. Um, you know what? I don't know exactly what those black dots are on the side of the snapping shrimp. I'm not quite sure. And if you can go back to that one, that would be really cool, Stephanie, to play the snapping shrimp vocalization. Okay. I'm trying here. I don't know what it is. <laughs> trying to talk about the hydrosphere, but a little bit of both, right? And yeah, blue whale sounds are fascinating. I agree. Yes, anthropogenic noise is definitely an issue, most definitely. Uh, rising temperatures, bodies of water affect mammals. So rising temperature, that's part of the problem we're trying to deal with now. So rising temperatures could be an issue for food sources. Right now we're having obviously the problem in Florida with the uh, um, lack of seagrasses, which is, could be a potential, potential problem. So it's their food sources that has most of an issue. Oh, we do, yay. Hi, Erin, nice to follow each other on Instagram. <laughs> So anthropogenic, the three types of anthropogenic, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think I've gotten it pulled up for us here. Perfect. Should I stop share? And that will Yeah, probably... I'm going to go ahead and try sharing mine real fast. Um, hopefully this will play the sound. Let me just go back. I hope so too. So yeah, play the sound. That's the best. Okay. Let's see if this works. Well, it's definitely playing. <laughs> You can't hear it though? I can't. 
see. Maybe you need to share sound. So yeah. Stephanie, there's a new setting. I wrote it in the chat. If you look in your sharing toolbar, I think if there's like an audio setting on the left-hand side that they recently changed and you have to do something. There's like a, a little box you could unclick that says something about like matching. Um, it's something about like matching the um, speaker audio to your voice audio or something, mic audio. I'm looking. Um... So go like go in your actual share the screen share toolbar when you're uh -huh. screen Do you see there's like like a drop Advanced down sharing of... options? Hold on here. I'm just trying, trying to see if I uh, share sound. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, check. There's like something you have to unclick that might work. Ah, yeah. work. Okay. Yay. You guys hear snap, snap, crackle, and pop there? Okay, so yes. let, me, let me move to where you were there. There's your guy, your cute and little snapping shrimp. And then All right, ready for this next one? So if you guys have any guesses, but I already kind of gave it away <laughs> of what it was. But I want you to look at the frequency content of that vocalization. And just so you know, it's below six kilohertz. You hear those sounds around the reefs all the time. Does anybody have any idea? And I know I showed you the picture earlier of <laughs> what potentially this could be. And this is biological, just so you know, like the snapping shrimp was. So whenever you're ready, Stephanie, you can click that up for me. It's not okay. a frog, I did give it away. Oh, mangrove? Right here. There. Yeah, so this is a toadfish, right? These are sounds made from fish. Most people don't know that fish actually make a lot of interesting sounds too through their, um, uh, their bladder, their swim bladder. Um, yeah, interesting sounds that fish do make a lot of sounds. Can you go to the next slide, please? Right. Let's play this one. Not made by a animal. Any ideas of what that could be? <laughs> Sounds like. Hmm, <laughs> that's close. Bubbles is good. Very close. Someone's like a bottle. Ooh, yes. Yeah. So this is running water. So even underneath the water, we have a lot of currents and streams and things that can make a lot of noise, which makes it difficult to get those really nice, clean spectrograms to look at. Yeah. And then the, I think we have one more sound here, Stephanie, to look at. That's probably not yes, everyone. Wow. Yes. On point, yes, boat. Um, anytime we are out in the wild, you definitely get a lot of boat noise and you can see how loud that is and how it covers the whole spectrogram. So imagine for a manatee being out in the wild and having to hear all these many, many boats going by. So yeah, that is boat noise. And if you ever want any of these slides, please email me, I'm happy to share them with you for ambient noise. I have many sounds of many other marine mammals too as well. Um, yeah, extremely disruptive. So uh, yeah, that was my talk today. And I just wanted to say thank you for your patience first and foremost. And yeah, I love that last image because I love, you know, you can record just about anything, even a goldfish in a fish bowl, right? And get sounds um, and it's one way to do it. I don't recommend doing it that way. Um, but I hope it gave you a little bit of a primer into acoustics, how sound is important underwater and the things that you can hear um, if you use an underwater microphone or a hydrophone. Beth, would you mind sticking around for just a few minutes uh, for presentations in case there's q and Do you have the time to do that? If yeah, not, definitely. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Definitely. We appreciate that. I'm going to go ahead and move to the next presenter um, with us today. Let me get to my page here. We've got Michael Tedessa. He is a graduate student working towards a PhD from the University of Central Florida, and he uh, studies coastal risks and engineering. Uh, he works within the coastal risks and engineering lab with Dr. Wall, and his interest is in data science, machine learning, and coastal engineering. And his presentation today uh, is about observing the, co the global coast through data. So, Michael, I'm going to go ahead and let you share and take it away.
Thank you, Stephanie. Can you hear me? Can you hear me well? We sure can. Okay. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. You got to go nights in the chat box there. Couple go nights. <laughs> okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Um, okay. Thank you everyone for coming and uh, attending this presentation. Uh, my name is Michael and I'll be talking about observing the global coast through data and uh, some of the research that I'm doing here at UCF. So my name is uh, Michael Getacho Tadessa. Uh, I'm from Ethiopia, uh, born and raised in Addis Ababa. And uh, currently I'm a graduate student at UCF. Um, I have a background in civil engineering and flood risk management uh, previously. Uh, also uh, after graduation, I worked in a, uh, at the Danish uh, Hydraulic Institute in Denmark also in uh, the South Florida Water Management District uh, with uh, water uh, operations and hydraulic structures uh, uh, management uh, department there. And at the moment, I, I'm also an intern at Hazen and Sawyer uh, consulting firm. We do a lot of water resources uh, stuff. So uh, I do research, but at the same time, I also try to <clears throat> work on projects uh, on the side. Uh, that's about me. Uh, today, I'll be talking a lot about hurricanes and storm surges and extreme sea levels. And uh, I believe living in Florida, we are like, aware of this situation and what a hurricane is, uh, what a storm surge is, and what it does to our uh, you know, properties, our coasts, even to us humans. Uh, some of the major hurricanes that happened in Florida, for instance, are Hurricane Michael, from 2018, uh, Hurricane Irma and Harvey, uh, really powerful and very, um, a lot of rainfall and precipitation event that led to severe events, flooding events. And uh, also we remember about Hurricane Katrina in 2005 that devastated the city of Orleans, New Orleans. And it's really important to study this uh, phenomenon uh, and try to predict them and to understand them so that we can better uh, build coastal infrastructures that are resilient and also to basically and save lives. And um, yeah, that's, it's really important to understand them and predict them. Otherwise we will be uh, you know, impacted severely. So uh, that's the theme of my discussion today and the research that I'm doing with regards to understanding storm surge and how we can predict it. So if you go to the beach, uh, you will be able to observe um, a lot of things. Uh, so if you look at the water surface, for instance, in the beach, um, um, you may not notice this, but the water surface is comprised of a lot of layers. Uh, for instance, there is this mean sea level. Uh, we, we call it mean sea level. Uh, this is the, the level of the sea or the ocean when there's no uh, wind, there's no uh, storms. It's just quiet and calm. It's just, just a mean sea level uh, of the water. That's the baseline, right? Uh, but we, on top of that, we do get tides, uh, which is basically the, uh, the level of water that's added to the mean sea level because of the interaction of the earth with the moon and the sun. Uh, that actually leads to some interesting events here in Florida. For instance, if you go to Miami, there's this thing we call nuisance flooding or sunny day flooding, which is uh, there's no storm, there's no wind, no hurricanes, but it happens to be flooding in the middle of the city. That is because uh, the tides themselves, they have evolved and they have increased in their um, heights during the years. and uh, that just happens to flood the, uh, the cities because it's just beyond the capacity of the stormwater uh, drainage. Uh, and in addition to tides, we also have uh, storm surges. These are uh, interesting events usually uh, happening because of the meteorology of the environment. If you have, for instance, strong winds and uh, very low pressures, 
they they induce storm surges. Uh, they just increase the normal sea level uh, of the ocean, and uh, uh, yeah, that will lead to some uh, some some uh, events that I will talk about later on. Uh, but yeah, so we have mean sea level, tides, and storm surges. But also on top of that, you may notice waves. Um, it's interesting because for people who love surfing, you want waves, you want them to, to be there, but also waves can be uh, dangerous if, if, if they are beyond the capacity of, uh, uh, you know, uh, coastal infrastructure. So these are the different uh, layers of the, the sea level um, and when you go to the beach and you look at the coastal environment. So it might, my research specifically is concerned about determining storm surges and uh, accurately predicting them so that we can build an infrastructure that you know withstand uh, the forces of storm surge right so i'm sure you're aware of storm surge but like i have a couple of animations to show you what uh, it looks like this one is showing uh, a hurricane event like category 1 and how you know the, the, the water propagates to the coast and how the wind basically pushes the water, uh, which is above the normal sea level. And it keeps increasing as you have like, the, as the category increases, it becomes more stronger and higher. And this is also an interesting uh, animation. It's an animation showing like how, let's say a three feet storm surge looks like a six feet, nine feet, just to give a perspective to, you know, uh, uh, citizens uh, to understand like what, you know, uh, the dangers and the risk involved with storm surge. I believe this is a six feet uh, high storm surge. Basically this drowns a person and it's very dangerous. And, you know, it just keeps increasing depending on the hurricane event you might have even uh, nine, 12 feet uh, high storm surge events, as you will see here. And um, I believe Hurricane Michael um, had about nine to 11 feet in 20, 2018 in the city of New Mexico. So these things are really dangerous, you know, and it's better to be prepared in terms of building a resilient infrastructure and understanding the impacts of climate change. So. Uh, yeah, that's a, a background on uh, storm surges. So in, in my research, I try to understand the environment uh, by collecting data and using that data to uh, uh, simulate and predict storm surges, right? So for that, you need a lot of data. So for instance, you might need uh, a water level data, right? So that's, uh, this is a tide gauge, which basically measures the water level in a coastal area or river or lake. So you just measure the water level and you record it and put it in a database because you'll use it later. Uh, this is a, a tides, um, tide analysis data. So tides are uh, relatively easier to measure and also to predict. So you just collect this data, you can accurately predict what the tides will be uh, in, in, in a coastal environment 10 years out, 50 years out. So uh, they are important in determining storm surges. And this is a, a sea surface data. Uh, this is basically how hot is uh, the, the ocean, right? What's the surface temperature in, in that area? Because uh, it's important to have that information because hurricanes, basically they feed off of uh, the temperature of the ocean. So if you have a warmer temperature in the ocean that basically strengthens the hurricane. So knowing that will definitely help us to uh, determine hurricane strength. Uh, this is a sea level pressure. So what, what this does uh, is if you notice like, uh, like for instance, hurricane tracking, like in the news, they basically talk about the pressure in the middle of the, the hurricane, right? So that's the lowest uh, pressure in, in the hurricane because um, yeah, you have a lot of wind action going on in the surface but in the middle of the, the hurricane eye, that's where you find the lowest pressure. And that basically pulls the water upwards because it's, it's like using a straw to pull water, right? Or uh, juice. So it just pulls the water in the middle of the eye. And then you have a strong wind, which basically pushes the water to the surface or to the coast. So that, that's the, 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 
uh, damaging uh, impact of a hurricane. So knowing the pressure in the surrounding environment also helps us to kind of determine if this is storm surge inducing um, climate or weather. Uh, this is precipitation data. Uh, also, this is important because the more rain or precipitation you have, the more water you're adding to the system, right? So, so that will exacerbate the flooding uh, uh, effect uh, of um, the hurricane or the storm surge. And this is animal major that basically uh, measures the wind speed and wind speed is very critical for storm surge and uh, it's, it's a determinant uh, to uh, calculating storm surges. So th there's, there's a lot of things to consider, but these are the most fundamental ones. And ultimately they will help us to uh, determine what a storm surge looks like uh, or just approximate, uh, for instance, this is from Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut, I believe, and uh, the Hurricane Sandy event. So uh, the blue line basically tells us what the storm surge um, is, is like in, in that day. This is the highest, I believe, in November, beginning of November. And you want to be able to approximate that with using your model, right? Uh, if you underestimate that, just like this one, for instance, uh, you are basically kind of underestimating the strength of the storm surge and you might be underprepared. So you want to be as good as, let's say, like the green model, which it basically captures everything. Uh, so moving on, uh, yeah. So where do we get the data? The data that I just uh, explained earlier. There's a lot of sources out there, but for my research, I'm using satellite data uh, from NASA, from NOAA. These are uh, national agencies that provide a lot of environmental data, including precipitation, tides and currents, and um, all kinds of uh, data that you might need for your research. There's also another European agency providing pretty much the same data, but using different satellites. So. It's always good to combine and compare and contrast different data for your research. And there are also tide gauges that I mentioned earlier. These are like ground uh, truth. You just uh, you have a data that's measured from the ground. Uh, satellites measure from you know uh, uh, outer space. Bo both of them have different pros and cons, but in, in research, you combine them and just take the best out of those two. And uh, you also have online tools like this one, for instance, where you can actually go and um, observe what's happening in, in your area. This is, for instance, tracking the uh, hurricane or I believe tropical storm Elsa, uh, showing the uh, potential path. Uh, you have also different things to look at, the wind, uh, uh, the precipitation, you can just open these things up and see and get uh, an understanding of what's going on, right? So all these data come from different sources uh, uh, for uh, research. And zooming on, zooming on on my research project. So what I'm doing is basically to um, uh, reconstruct storm surge data from really uh, uh, a long time ago, uh, beginning from the 1800s. So uh, I reconstruct storm surges from 1836 until the present day and provide a data set that can be used for further coastal engineering um, experiments, right? So this is useful because uh, we, we learned that there is not enough data out there uh, to do these experiments. For instance, if you want to design a critical infrastructure uh, on the coast, it could be a space a station or a nuclear reactor you really need a, a, a very uh, long record of data. Uh, it could be a sea level data, storm surge data, uh, wave uh, data. You need uh, as much data as you need as, as you can get uh, to be able to, to have a very uh, uh, risk oriented and uh, well prepared uh, design, right? So that's not the case, unfortunately, most of the coast in Africa and Southeast Asia, and mostly in the Southern Hemisphere, we don't have that kind of data. So that's where this research is kind of filling the gap. So if you go to this, the project website, what you will see is basically um, different tide gauge, tide gauge locations. Uh, bear with me, it's, uh, the website might take a little bit 
time. But yeah, these are the different locations uh, where you can go and get the data. So if you wanna design a coastal infrastructure, let's say here, uh, there is data, uh, storm surge data that you can use that begins from 1800s until the present day. And this will be very important uh, for engineers who want to consider the different trends, right? These days we're talking about climate change, how uh, it is impacting uh, the frequency and uh, um, intensity of the, the hurricanes themselves, right? So if, if you want to study that and if you want to build uh, critical infrastructure that is able to withstand that, you need to have data that goes back, uh, back to you know, uh, 1800s and 1900s and that will make the design more robust. Uh, also in the research, we, we do a lot of quality control so that the data passes um, those requirements. Uh, I can talk about these things in detail, but uh, because of time, I'll just skip them. Uh, we do detect uh, long-term trends in, in the storm surges. It's very likely that these storm surge events increase uh, as you go in time. And uh, it's because of different uh, factors, uh, climate change is one of them. Also anthropogenic uh, factors also uh, play part when people dredge uh, rivers, for instance, that uh, leads to more flooding events in some places. Uh, so there are different factors to consider, but uh, understanding how the trends change uh, and evolve uh, is very important uh, from the perspective of climate science. And also projecting extreme storm, storm surges is also very important because, yeah, these days we talk about, let's say, 100-year flooding event, 200-year flooding event. Uh, you hear these things in the news, for instance. What they mean is basically that event, let's say a precipitation event or a hurricane, uh, when they say it's a 100-year event, it doesn't mean it comes every 100 years. It means that there is a 1% if it's 100 year event, it, there, it means it's, there is 1% chance that this thing might come next year or the year after next year. So it, the probability may be very low, but uh, when it happens, it's very, uh, it's very powerful and very uh, devastating. So uh, predicting those extreme events uh, uh, will be very important. Uh, like, as you might uh, notice for in the case of Hurricane Katrina, for instance, I, I don't think anybody has uh, anticipated that uh, so to be able to be in a position to uh, build your coastal infrastructure that you know withstands even these kinds of uh, horrific events uh, is is going to be uh, the way to to go in, in the coming uh, decade or um, yeah that's how scientists tell us uh, the way it should be done so the research is basically revolving around these things. And um, in the real world, um, how does the research benefit? It benefits scientists themselves by providing um, a long record of storm surge data, right? So uh, that helps them to study the trends and to uh, make uh, uh, future recommendations uh, for this will be useful for uh, agencies uh, regulating, for instance, constructions or maintenance of infrastructure in coastal areas. It will help them to either retreat or build infrastructure that withstands the, the, the uh, potential uh, hazard. Also uh, from the perspective of, um, you know, um, young minds, for instance, uh, this data set that we are providing will help teachers and students to understand the effects of climate change. So if a teacher, for instance, goes uh, to uh, this project website and just is wondering about what's going on in Australia, right? So they just get the data from here and they, they just plot it and show the students, okay, the storm surge was um, this much bigger in the 1900s, but in the 21st century, this is what it looks like. So we can definitely see the trends and there is a change of um, uh, uh, climate. There is actually something happening in our environment. So that might give some kind of perspective to students and, and uh, having that understanding of uh, these extreme sea level events. And we talk about it every year in the hurricane season and it just, it shouldn't be just limited to hurricane season in my opinion. So uh, that's what uh, the research I believe can contribute um, to our daily uh, 
uh, lives. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, uh, thank you for your attention. And if you want to hear more from me, this is my Twitter and my LinkedIn. And you can get more info about my project uh, on, on the research from this website. And uh, here is my email. And I'm looking forward to your questions and discussions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michael. That was very informative, very exciting. I actually personally didn't understand the 100 years thing. So thank you for clarifying oh, that. Okay. Um, I want to ask if it's possible that we can hold questions for one more presenter. Are you able to stick around with us? Yeah, sure. I'll be, I'll be here. Okay, fantastic. Um, then without further ado, I'm going to now turn things over to Dr. Peter Adams. He's an associate professor. He's with the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Florida. And he's gonna talk a little bit about the coastal geomorphology. Um, so I'll let you take it away, Peter. Peter, while you're getting things set up, um, you should be able to screen share there. Um, folks, if you need to take a bathroom break or anything, just you know, shut your camera off, that's fine. You can go ahead and do that. We're running a little bit behind and we certainly uh, don't want you to um, you know, wait or stall if you don't need to. <laughs> so please do that. Okay, sorry about that delay. Uh, can you hear me? We sure can. And we can see your presentation, it looks great. Okay, and good, we're in presentation mode, not the, the background mode. All right, um, well, thanks for this opportunity. This is uh, when I was contacted by Brian and Stephanie, I thought oh, this is a great chance to actually connect to people who have the opportunity to connect with our students, the future scientists and um, future researchers and just the future stakeholders in the type of work that I do. Um, and I also wanna, uh, uh, thank Michael, the preceding speaker, for uh, uh, a great talk on something that is a nice segue to what I'm going to be talking about, uh, that, that really interesting work that Michael is doing about um, storm surge and water levels connects, and I'm going to take us one step closer to the landscape here. So the, the what my topic is, is coastal geomorphology, and I want to <clears throat> demonstrate that this is a field of study that links both the ocean and terrestrial landscape to the Earth's changing climate, and and in many ways, I I want to uh, well, I think some of the examples I give, I hope, can be uh, valuable for for the people in attendance, for the educators we've got with us, to kind of set the hook with some students that they can connect with and show them the different ways that um, this thing, coastal geomorphology, can get people involved and excited in studying Earth sciences. So as uh, Stephanie mentioned, um, at the University of Florida, I run a research group, uh, it's the UF uh, the Geomorphology Research Group. There are, um, we're in the Geological Sciences Department. And what really is geomorphology? It's really the study of the Earth's surface and how that surface changes. And what's, what are those changes attributed to? So as you can see in the leftmost panel, I'm showing a digital elevation map, map or a digital elevation model of part of the Florida Peninsula. Um, and I often say, well, anybody can be a geomorphologist in Alaska or California where the, the mountains are right in your face and there's just a, a, a really um, impactful landscape. When I moved to Florida, I realized, um, okay, I'm going to have to really develop a more discerning eye to do work here. But one of the tools we have and one of the tools we use is the digital elevation models. And so here in that leftmost panel, I've dialed the colors just right to really enhance the relief on the Florida Peninsula. And if, you, if you're just driving around, sometimes you don't really recognize the, the features of the peninsula. But if you look at it, um, in a view like this, you can see it's remarkably well organized and there's, it's screaming for explanations to how, um, how this, 
how the landscape came about. You know, if we dropped sea level 100 meters as we have during the last glacial maximum 100,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago, um, Florida might have the most remarkable geology uh, on the planet. It's just that it's kind of inaccessible to those of us who aren't cave divers. Um, and so I, I also put this slide up there to demonstrate that um, I've had a real privilege to work with some excellent uh, graduate students, undergraduate students and postdocs along the way. And, and this is just showing how my research group has uh, kind of waxed and waned over the years, usually between four and as many as 10 people involved. And, and the shot in the lower right hand corner of 2020, that was how our research group looked most recently, uh, just a bunch of Zoom meetings. So, but it it's still, we're fortunate that we can uh, continue to do our work um, remotely uh, because so much of the data we collect, we've, we've got to churn through a lot of it. So, as I mentioned, I'm gonna go through a series of research themes that we've worked on. And, and I'll try and be mindful to, um, to demonstrate how these themes can be brought into the K through 12 classrooms or, or maybe something about them that's interesting or intriguing to, to students uh, learning about this. And, and like I said, it can be a sort of a, a gateway to getting into STEM stuff and the earth sciences in particular. So my background was um, uh, bachelor's degrees and master's degrees at Penn State. I also had a degree in chemical engineering from Penn State, which really gave me a foundation in the quantitative um, uh, tools that have been very valuable. So all of geology, all of geomorphology is moving toward a more quantitative direction. Um, and I think that it's important to encourage our students um, to, to take those kind of classes. Sometimes they may be averse to it, but um, any little bit of uh, the, the math and the physics and the chemistry all goes into the earth sciences. So um, it's, it's, they, they work really well hand in hand. It's not to say you can't do geomorphology without studying that stuff, but um, it's helpful. It's a helpful tool. And so, but what's nice about it is some, some of the students who maybe have a bit of a fear of math and physics, you can show them with projects like these. Um, look, it's not just about working a problem on a page, it's about discovering something that people hadn't seen before. And one of the first things I got to discover was uh, during my PhD, which is at UC Santa Cruz, um, when I was getting involved in coastal geomorphology for the first time, um, I had, uh, I was living there, seeing these remarkable marine terraces rising up from the ocean. And I thought, and would, I, I was asking my advisor, Bob Anderson at the time, how do these things form? How does this stair step of marine terraces form coming from the ocean? And he had some ideas about it, but he said, you know, I encourage you to look at just even how the sea cliffs are forming. And so we came up with a project where we put a seismometer, something that measures ground motion. You can see me as a young, naive graduate student in the upper right corner, um, putting a seismometer at the edge of a sea cliff there um, to get data on how the cliff shakes. And so the cliff shaking is shown in the two panels um, in the lower middle uh, hour of east-west velocity data. And so it's measuring the the ground motion in terms of velocity. Um, and never mind that the units of velocity are volts there. That's, uh, that's everyone's favorite unit of velocity, right? Um, but it, there's a conversion from volts to microns per second. And when you zoom into the data that we were collecting and just see a two minute view there in the lowermost panel, uh, you can see there's this consistent swaying, this periodicity to it that we didn't understand at first. So we put cameras out and I, I filmed the waves coming in at the, simultaneously with what the sea cliffs were doing. And we saw, wow, this is remarkable. Every time a new wave comes in, the cliff bends down ever so slightly, not so much you can, as you can feel it, but it bends down and it flexes just a few microns with every wave coming in. 
so we took that theory we, we thought is this real and we it, we did some statistics and looked at power spectra and said it is happening in sync with the wave gauge that we've put out in the shallow water um and so it led us to this hypothesis that i'm showing all the way on the on the left of these cliffs are flexing with every incoming wave ever so little but if the flexing is happening and it's differential flexing well then there's micro cracking occur occurring in the cliff rocks and if that micro cracking is occurring then you're at what's a 10 second period wave how many times is that flexing per year it's about 3 million flexes per year 3 million times a year we're we're fatiguing this rock and so what happens when a big El Nino storm comes in? Well, it's going to sweep all that munged up, cracked up, external fractured fringe of bedrock and move the cliff back. So as we go from initial time to middle time to final time, we can see this way that the cliff moves back. And people hadn't really talked about the, these mechanics before. Um, but uh, this was something that was neat to discover. Um, Let's see here, move forward. So then I, when I arrived at the University of Florida, we wanted to continue this work a little bit and I had a really um, bright and uh, hardworking graduate student, Sean Klein, who took these data and, um, and developed a, a model, a numerical model of how the cliffs retreat. And so that was great because we had this theory of this cyclical flexing and the fatigue of the cliffs and then sean put this into a model that we could say then these the, i'll take a step back and say that why are these models important they're not just in a sense predictive models something that will happen in the future they allow us to dial up all the settings the way we want them and run our own experiments you know when nature is producing waves and cliff retreat we basically get one experiment. That's the natural laboratory. We get to observe what's happening in nature. But in a numerical model, what we can do is, if we know the physics, we can set the wave heights, set the energy, set the tidal variability, and then let the model rip and see, okay, what combinations of forcings give us certain patterns or timing of retreat, uh, of cliff retreat. So that's, that's why I'm always encouraging students to take the direct observations in the field, but also see how that can inform your model and then keep those observations and models evolving to um, produce a better understanding of how these systems work. At that time though, I had moved to Florida and I thought, I've got this whole peninsula of opportunities where we can conduct research. And so rather than staying on these cliff coasts in California, um, I wanted to get familiar with the local landscape. And so the closest uh, Atlantic coast site to, to Gainesville, where we're located at the University of Florida, is um, Anastasia Island. And the southern end of that is Matanzas Inlet. So I had some equipment, uh, this RTK GPS equipment, it's very high resolution um, field surveying equipment and a new graduate student, Catherine Malone at the time, and she was interested in going out and making these measurements. I said, terrific, let's start a program that we go out um, and we look at the observations. I'm not sure, can you guys see my mouse um, pointing? Okay, so I'll use, the mouse is a pointer here, great, in the lower left. And we just took this one and a half kilometers of coast and said, let's go out there every month and determine what, um, what we're seeing in terms of beach variability. And so at transect 20 up here, we can see 12 or 13 months of variability. At transect 135, which is down by the inlet, we see a lot more variability. Um, and then we can couple that work with some of these numerical models shown in the right here um, to say, why is it? What is it about the ocean nearshore currents, the waves, the patterns, the directions of flow 
that are influencing the beach morphology. And this was work with, um, I think, Friday's keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Maitane Olabarrieta, uh, also at University of Florida. We've got, had some great collaborations with her. She's um, really an expert in running some of these models. So it's been um, really fruitful collaboration. Um, realize I'm taking a little long on all of these. So I'm gonna start clipping through a little more quickly. We got an opportunity to work with researchers at NASA Kennedy Space Center. Um, and you can see, I love this beautiful satellite photo of uh, KSC and, and the Cape Canaveral Air Force um, station down here. This is such a unique feature along the otherwise mostly straight Florida coast. You've got this big bump that's sticking out into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and we've got billion dollar, multi-billion dollar piles of concrete out there from which now SpaceX is launching. Um, uh, it has 99 year leases for these launch pads, but these things are extremely co close to the coast and we're seeing critical launch infrastructure be threatened. So um, working with um, another colleague at UF and our graduate student, Rich McKenzie, Rich went out there every month and generated these lovely digital elevation models of the 10 kilometer reach of coastline um, that is the NASA Kennedy Space Center property. Um, and what's, what was neat about that was that uh, we were able to um, develop this system that efficiently measures uh, with the RTK system, two data points at a time. So you can see as Rich is sitting in the front of this uh, Polaris Ranger, we're dragging these two antennas and the, the tracks of the antennas can be shown here. So we'd spend an hour and a half driving along the beach one direction and then an hour and a half coming back down the beach in the other direction to cover a whole 10 kilometers. And it gave us these really um, detailed maps uh, that show us individual beach cusps. And we could do those monthly maps and figure out, okay, how much is this beach changing every month? And NASA used that information to uh, manage their dune construction and their plantings of, uh, I think 80,000 individual plants to um, stabilize this new dune they had put in. So that work led to a project with a group at the University of Florida, Dr. Arnaldo Valle Levinson and people, uh, researchers at UF Fisheries, which was funded by the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management, um, where we look just offshore of Cape Canaveral and we instrumented these shoals, oops, uh, we instrumented these shoals with what are called acoustic Doppler current profilers. And that's just, these instruments that sit on the seafloor look up and can tell you what the currents are doing, time series of currents and waves and water levels. And we were trying to connect those individual water motions to what we're seeing month to month on shoreline change. That was a terrific project. And we built this great um, relationship with another lab group, as you can see. Uh, a number of us working on the, that project. This was a really uh, successful study that netted a lot of great understanding in the form of uh, about five or six publications that we're able to point to and say, this is, this is really what we've learned about this site. And it's opened a lot of other research opportunities. Stephanie, I'll ask what time I should aim to wrap up by. I know um, we're running behind. Yeah, no, we want you to, to do what you need to do to continue. We've got, um, according to the uh, schedule. Sorry, I can't hear you. Maybe it's muted or maybe it's. Are you able to hear me now? Can hear I me? can hear can her. Anybody hear? Okay. <laughs> you have me nervous. Now I can. Okay. okay. Um, we have uh, up until 1030, and, but we do want to allow some time for questions. There's some great conversation and questions coming in the chat box that we'd love to get to as well. Uh, but I don't want to rush rush you either. No, no. Okay. So I'm going to 
I'll keep that in mind. I'll try and wrap it up in a few minutes. Okay, that uh, sounds great. Great, thank you. So then we realized, okay, we're measuring this stuff monthly. We're measuring the hydrodynamics, but what's happening over the decadal scale? What's happening over tens, 20, 30, 40, 80 years of change? Um, we didn't have a lot of information to go on, but one place to start is aerial photos. And this is a great tool for K through 12 students to, to use, particularly if you can get some air photos that show you know, a lot of before and after stuff. And a great place to go to do this is Google Earth Engine. I should have put a link there, but it's easy, easily Googleable. It's um, Earth Engine, Google Earth Engine. And it, you can see time series of satellite imagery that show how features are changing. Um, you know, now that we've got the 40 years almost of Landsat imagery, we've got a, some really strong signals. But if we take that back also with air photos dating back to the, say the 1950s or even the 1940s, we were able to see, okay, there are some portions of the beach like up here at um, transect, I'm not even sure which transect I'm showing, but this is a transect up in the north and near these launch pads, you can see these launch pads, these is 39A and 39B where the space shuttle had launched from, where um, SpaceX currently launches from. And then um, a spot a little further down, this is probably around transect uh, 110 or so, I think I can see in faint white font. And if we plotted from 1940 to the early 2000s for each of them, where that shoreline was, you can see that they're going in totally opposite directions. One shoreline is retreating, one shoreline is advancing. And so if we plot that up and kind of schematize it and showing what's happening in the beach, the beach is rotating. So as much as the, the beach is vulnerable here by the launch pads, unfortunately, um, unfortunately for all that critical launch infrastructure, it's actually advancing here by this feature called false cape. And, and so the question is then like, well, that, that seems strange. Wouldn't you imagine if wave climate is intensifying, um, shouldn't the beach be retreating all uniformly? And that we're seeing that's definitely not the case. There's a lot of beach rotation out there. And the, that complicates things because if we could project that uh, say all locations on the Florida Atlantic coast have to prepare for 50 meters of retreat in the next 50 years, well, that's one thing. But some places are gonna see advance and some places are gonna see more like 100 meters of retreat just from the, the, the data that we're seeing. Um, and that retreat often happens in fits and starts. So if you go uh, at that location, here's launch pad 39A before Hurricane Sandy, this is a railroad, um, a coastal railroad where they would right at this location. And then after Hurricane Sandy, you can see the railroads being undermined by that big bite that Sandy, when it swung by, took out in the form of high wave energy. And if you look at the profiles, this is now looking along shore. Um, this is January of 2010 in blue. August of 2010, you can see it had built out a little bit, but then November of 2012 after Hurricane Sandy, all of that high crest had been removed and it was approaching the railroad, um, making it very vulnerable. So we see these event scale things, that's really how this thing goes back, how these shorelines retreat, how these dunes are wiped out in events and sometimes they don't recover like the green line shows us. So we wanna find out the conditions under which that's occurring. And we also wanna look at what's wave climate doing. And so um, after my PhD, before I came to Florida, I was fortunate to work at, on a project where we looked at wave climate and coastal evolution on this Florida, uh, sorry, on the California coast in Southern California at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, uh -oh, I'm getting the, your internet connection is unstable. So I hope I don't. We're still out. hearing you loud and clear. Terrific. Um, 
I won't go into too much detail here, but this was a project looking at El Nino years and something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And so there's El Nino cyclicity, which is like a two to seven year cycle, but there's also a 30 to 50 year cycle, which is this Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And sometimes when those things coincide, you get wave directions. You don't even need intensification of wave heights. You can see just the changing wave directions means the waves hit the coast at a more direct orientation giving a greater component of their energy, even if it's the same wave heights from the two different directions. And that greater component due to directionality is this understudied, under uh, investigated concept of wave climate change. So we don't need the waves to be necessarily getting larger and, and more energetic. All you need is for atmospheric patterns to shift and if the waves come from a different orientation, we're going to see rapid enhancements of retreat um, in various locations. So one of our jobs is to figure out where, where are those new vulnerable places? And to know that, we have to know about decadal wave climate. And this was a project that I got a student interested in, um, uh, Christian Provencia. He did a great job. He was a really enthusiastic master's student. Um, and he said, or we, we said together, let's look at what wave climate is doing along the Florida coast and uh, maybe Florida up to Cape Hatteras uh, uh, into the Carolinas. And so we looked at um, rates of increased wave height. And so I, I just made a spiel about direction, but the first step was to say, well, are the wave heights changing? And if so, what are they doing? So we look at these stations that had hindcast data um, these are numerical hindcasts, so they're artificial data derived from the winds, but they're pretty darn accurate when you compare them to real measurements of waves. And you could see these sloping lines are showing us rates of wave height increase. And if we plotted the wave height increase, we saw remarkably Cape Canaveral is seeing some of the highest intensification of the highest 5% of waves. So the most most energetic waves you see in the year, those are intensifying most rapidly at this peninsula at Cape Canaveral or this salient that sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean. Another unfortunate story for Kennedy Space Center. And the reason I have a picture of a Florida Gator football player here is that is Christian Provencia. He was a, a walk on to the Florida Gator football team. And, and I, I put that in to say like, you know, these the interested students are coming from all over campus, you know, and and he, he was able to take a class as an undergraduate with me and said, I really like this stuff. He was a bright young man. And I, I said, well, if you're interested, let's, you know, you can apply to work with our group. And and he did. And it was a real success. Um, and so I, I'm, I put this out for the educators to say, you know, there's the, <laughs> the old kind of classification of students in high school where some people are the jocks and some people are that that's you know science is for everybody and and it's really a great um great demonstration of that okay i think i've made my point about wave climate and i'm going to try and wrap this up um with one other topic and i think this is something that if, if bruce mcfadden is still on on the on the line here um he knows something about, we've talked extensively about it, and that's taking this idea of coastal geomorphology further inland and saying, what's happening to the Florida Peninsula, the whole platform here, over a much longer period. Um, when I first arrived at Florida, I had some conversations with uh, Professor Neil Opdyke, who's a recently passed on, but he was a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a, a real giant in the field of plate tectonics. And when Neil moved to Florida in the 1980s, he took a canoe trip with some of the graduate students on some of our disappearing streams or the Santa Fe River. And he, or, um, it struck him, he said, wow, Florida is eroding from the inside out. And what we mean by that is all this subsurface cave development the karst, the Florida karst, the, the limestone that's eroding is causing it to become like Swiss cheese. And so 
these Swiss cheese holes that are appearing in the subsurface um, are lightening the load of the peninsula. So just as a ship comes into port and unloads its cargo and rises up in the water, you know, the, the, the crust or the lithosphere of Florida is sitting on top of a mantle. And if you lighten the lithosphere through this dissolution of limestone and making holes in it, it's going to rise up. But it's going to do so differentially. And this is what Neil and I started talking about and had it. I, I just embraced this idea and I wanted to run out and, and, and learn more about it. So I put together this numerical model of sea level rise and fall precipitation on the landscape that's going to create this Swiss cheese, create this void space, and what it's going to do to the uplift of the Florida Peninsula. So this is why in cities like Gainesville, all our soil is sandy because that was marine soil. But as Bruce McFadden knows well, and many of the people who are involved in the paleontology, we look at a place like Trail Ridge, and that's 60 meters above modern sea level, and it's got marine fossils in it. And it's less than a million years old. So how is it that sea level was 60 meters higher in the last million years? It's, there's no evidence of that anywhere. But if you change your perspective and say, no, no, it's that the peninsula has risen 60 meters and emerged out of the sea level oscillations, which are down here. Well, that may be an explanation. And the last part I'll close with is just that um, we took this idea and we said, now, wait a minute, if Trail Ridge up here in the north is showing us these fossils, but this is all karstified down here, and we're looking at the St. John's River here, it flows northward, everyone says, oh, that's an enigma, why is it flowing northward? And we look at Cape Canaveral down here, which if you look at that thing closely and you look at other deltas, it looks like a delta, a fluvial delta, a place where a river is dumping its sediments, like the Mississippi River. But there's no evidence for a big river dumping out there. There's just a little piddly creek, banana, uh, banana creek here. But if you trace it through the landscape and you can see the trace of this, there is a connection between the St. John's River and this feature. So that got us to thinking, what if the uplift isn't happening like this? What if it's happening as a warping? because more of the limestone is exposed in the central part of the peninsula. If it's warping up like a bending a two by four, well then let's unwarp it back to maybe a hundred thousand years ago. And the St. John's would have flowed south then. So if it flowed south, that's the source for all the sediments that have built Cape Canaveral into a Delta. So this is kind of a, a crazy idea and that's why I didn't want to drag any of my colleagues down when we published it, but wrote this little paper a couple of years ago that just said, could Merritt Island and Cape Canaveral be a paleo delta of the reverse St. John's? Did this St. John's used to flow south? And now because of this tilting from karstification, it's flowing north. So I'd love to talk about some other students' research. I, I want to make sure that we leave time for other things. I just want to say in the classroom, I like to do hands-on demonstrations here and melting a block of ice and we put a piano or a guitar string around the ice and the ice will slice through and freeze on the back of it. So it's this magic trick and it shows how glaciers evolved. We need to, we, it's fun to talk about glaciers in Florida to the students. Um, this is a hill of beans that we slide this box down and we can show how a hill slope evolves as a river is down cutting and what angles that hill slope is going to take based on what the what the shape of the beans are. Um, love to go out in the field with the students. We take them to Anastasia State Park. They dig trenches. They measure the beach profiles. They jump up and down. They can a pretty pretty good time out there. Um, and in the classroom, I like to have them give undergraduate student poster presentations because. You know, then they have to explain it five times to five groups. So rather than standing up and giving one time, they have to talk about their case study to a whole classroom. They get to explain it five times to smaller groups of students as we migrate around the room, more like a national science, scientific conference meeting. And then some of the folks associated with the museum know that our department does a Can You Dig It outreach event at the museum every year. Here we have, um, 
kids and their parents come and we teach them about how tides work in barrier islands. Um, and I'll just close with saying, I try and keep updated with social media and, and, and make our presence felt out there because I think it's a great way to recruit students into our lab group and, and share what we're doing with, with, uh, with other researchers. So I'm gonna wrap that up and try, hope I've left some time for questions. That was truly awesome, Peter. Thank you so much. I know uh, I'm speaking for the whole group when I say science is awesome. Um, our presenters are awesome. And uh, we are crunched for some time with questions, but I'm going to try to get a few in, at least one for each of you. And um, I do invite scientists to check the chat box feed because there might be some others that have snuck by me. Um, teachers, as you know, if you've got questions, burning questions, let us know, let the scientists know, we'll get you the answers you're looking for. All these presentations are in the um, day's events for under presenter slides. So I think my first question, um, I'm actually going to start with you, Peter. Um, question, there was a lot of questions about participating in research. Do citizen scientists ever help with geomorphologists collect data? Uh, are there opportunities for people who are not students to be a part, perhaps of uh, summer research, et cetera? Can you speak to that? Sure, that's a great question. And it, it brings to mind a program that has been started by a group from the uni from, uh, University of New South Wales in Australia. This program is called Coast Snap. So you can Google Coast Snap, S-N-A-P. And I love this thing. I wanna set them up all along the Florida coast. Coast Snap is just a metal pole with a standardized piece of steel on it that fits an iPhone or an Android, or it, it fits um, you know, most of your standard smartphones. What it does for citizen science, it's usually set up on a place where you can get a good view of a beach. So out at the end of a pier or on top of a building or from, I don't know, a hotel or something like that. What, what it encourages people to do who walk by Coast Snap, there's a little sign that explains what it is. You put your phone there, there's a little QR code. It gives you, you hit the QR code, it gives you instructions, place your phone here take a photo of the beach, send that photo, or press this button, it'll send the photo to the Coast Snap database. And with the GPS in your phone, it tells you where it was taken, the timestamp, it tells you when it was taken. And then the image can be sent there. And because all these places have been surveyed and the features have been georectified, you can see in every person's um, photo that they send, is how the beach is either changing, what the shoreline's doing that day, what the dunes look like that day. And you can get some quantitative information from this citizen science tool. It's, it's truly a great way to employ interested citizens in, in participating in something that gives us real great data. Excellent, thank you. Um, this question's for Beth. Beth, Avery wants to know, can you um, get, resonation that amplifies the waves and also how do the manatee actually navigate murky water what sort of uh are they using a uh, echolocation how are they doing that so resonating yeah resonating happens a lot more so in enclosed environments um so and i don't have to deal a lot of with a lot of that working in uh, the wild i'm going to have to deal with some of that working in a captive environment when i do playback experiments but how do manatees navigate and that's the interesting thing that we don't exactly have the 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 answer to we do think it's based on their their memories and remembering where they go for long periods of time uh, that's how we think they get back to their warm water refuges and something we're going to be investigating at mode is to test the uh long-term memories of the manatees there so yeah we're still trying to answer those questions we don't think it's through hearing we just think maybe it's through they do have some visual acuity so we think maybe they do see some things but they tend to stay in the same general areas and tend to travel quite frequently to their warm water refuges and the place where they can find food thank you for that um michael we've got a few people that are wondering about um tidal bore the question i'm, I'm trying to read this uh here while i'm talking Wondering about tidal bore, but with the tide and the wave frequency amplitude amplifying the surge. Is, can you speak to that a little bit more? 
Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. Uh, I guess the tidal bore is basically when you have it happens when you have like a river meeting uh, a coastal environment, right? So you have the ocean and uh, you have a river flow uh, basically draining from the catchment and you have tides coming from the ocean. So when they when the tide basically tries to influence the river, that's when you, that's what you call tidal bore. Uh, I, I guess, I mean, that's a different system, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it will amplify the surge but I think people were referring to the nuisance flooding. That's when I talked about uh, uh, with no storms, no uh, wind action going on, just you, you have a city flooding. That's because of the, the, the growing height of the tides. The tides themselves, they evolved and they basically flood during king tides or uh, in, during the time period, you have like a very high tidal cycle or tidal uh, uh, height. I think that's uh, what uh, what they were talking about. But the tidal bore is a, a different system where you have those two things meet. I, I, I don't think they amplify the surge because the surge is mainly caused by the wind and the pressure and uh, yeah, all those factors I talked about. Is, does that make sense or did, did I not address the question? You can you can ask me again. If, if, if anybody wants to unmute and just clarify, um, please do so. Otherwise, I would assume that we answered that question. Let me see here. There's a new comment. Yeah, it makes sense. Yep. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, I think what we're going to do now, y'all, is move on to our next phase of the, uh, the day. And I want to, again, thank all three of our presenters this morning. If you do have any questions that you still would like answered that remain unanswered, let us know, forward us the questions. We'll get them to the scientists. You can email them direct from their presentation. Um, but thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today, all three of you. We really appreciate it. And we hope you stay safe for the, the remainder of the day, wherever you may be. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. OK. Everyone, we're going to be moving on to our modeling a hydrosphere themed lab exemplars. And uh, this will entail three of our amazing partners. They're going to be sharing resources with you, um, particularly different lessons themed on the work that they do. And we're going to be breaking you up into elementary, middle, and high school grade bands. You'll rotate through all three of the partner presenters. So um, depending on where you are in elementary, middle, or high school, you'll get to see those related presentations or lessons from each of them. You'll spend about 30 minutes in each session. So I think I'm going to turn it over to Brian now. He's got you sorted, and we're going to put you into those groups so you can uh, meet each of those organizations and hear what they have to offer for you all. Absolutely. And just for clarity, you will not have to move from room to room or anything like that. I'm going to be moving just the presenters themselves. All the elementary people will stay in that same breakout room. Middle will stay there. High school will stay there. And um, at that point, I will just be moving our presenters from room to room at the half hour mark um, for your next set of lesson exemplars. Um, the way this is set up in case of emergency, if you need to, it, it should allow you to come back into the main room if you need to touch base with me for any reason. I'm going to be staying here in case anybody wants to chat with me about anything. Um, if you need to touch base about anything, uh, I'm just going to stay here. Um, but if you have any other questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I am going to open up those rooms to make sure every 